Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy, a challenge to choose a side. I hope you're not the type of follower of Jesus Christ who sets their faith to room temperature. You know, two Sundays a month, uh, we'll put something in the offering plate. We'll pray once in a while for the church. And I want to tell you what Jesus thinks of that. Not much. He says, I want you either cold or hot. There is no middle. You're either for me or against me. You're in or you're out. cross, Jesus died for all of our sins. But what about the unpardonable sin? You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, and today Philip continues his series titled Essential Jesus, There Is No Stopping It, with a message that's sure to challenge you. If Jesus is Lord, then he's Lord of all. Is there any part of your life you're holding back? I'm Wayne Shepherd, inviting you to stay with us now for a free message as we learn to surrender everything to Jesus. Let's begin now. Here's Pastor Philip DeCourcy. A prominent psychologist made this astounding statement. Half of my patients could go home in a week if they knew they were forgiven. Oh, the peace and oh, the release of knowing that our sins are forgiven. Now, given that wonderful reality, I think you and I are troubled, are we not, by the words here in Mark chapter 3 especially verses 28 through to 30, where the Lord Jesus Christ talks about a sin that cannot be forgiven. We love to focus on the fact, the blessedness of transgressions covered and sins forgiven. But Jesus warns us there is a sin that's eternal in its consequence, a sin that's unpardonable. That's an ominous prospect. And so, I want us to come and look at this passage together and look at what's commonly known as the unpardonable sin. A troubling truth, but it is a truth and one we must grapple with in the text of Mark's gospel. Verses 20 through 30 of Mark chapter 3, the first phase of his ministry in Galilee is over. There's been controversy throughout that first phase. We're now entering this second phase on the other side of the calling of the twelve. And the animosity of the leaders of Israel towards Jesus is calcifying and becoming very rigid to a point where Jesus issues them a warning. You keep going in this direction and you'll cross a line. That's a point of no return. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit for which there is no forgiveness. By the way, I think what comes out of this passage and the greater context is there is no neutrality when it comes to the Lord Jesus, all right? You're either for him, you revere him, you love him, you want to follow him, or you're against him, and you'll deny his claims, and you'll oppose his work. Let's look at verses 20 and 21 quickly. The unfortunate misjudgment. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread, But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said he is out of his mind. Before Mark deals with the outright rejection of Jesus by the religious leaders, he begins with the section here that deals with the skepticism of his own family. Mary was a believer, but his own brothers weren't. The jury was still out. And that will play into what's going on here. So, you know, it's pretty consistent among the commentators. But when his own people, that's when his family heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him. Look at the verb lay hold of. Strong verb in the Gospels. It can mean to hold against someone's will. So basically, they come 30 miles into Capernaum, and they're going to literally yank the Lord Jesus. Get him home. Speak a little sense into him. Make sure this Messiah thing isn't going to his head. The priests are talking about it. The rabbis are talking about it. Come on, you're shaming the home enough. And you and I need to alert ourselves to the fact that if we follow Jesus Christ the way Jesus Christ followed the Father, at some point people are going to think you a little loopy, outside the norm. 
I hope you're not the type of follower of Jesus Christ who sets their faith to room temperature. You know, two Sundays a month, uh, we'll put something in the offering plate. We'll pray once in a while for the church. Room temperature Christianity. I don't want to tell you what Jesus thinks of that. Not much. Look at his letter to the church at Laodicea. He says, I want you either cold or hot. Now, I hope you understand the point Jesus is making there. You know, I don't mind if you're cold. He's just saying there is no middle. There is no middle. You're either cold or you're hot. Or as he says in Matthew 12, you're either for me or against me. You're in or you're out. You're following or you're backsliding. Cold or hot. And you know the background there that Laodicea was surrounded by Hierapolis and Colossae. Colossae had these beautiful cold mountain springs, give you clear, cold, refreshing water. Hierapolis had these therapeutic hot springs that people went to for health issues. Smack in the middle of that geography and topology, you've got Laodicea, and its water ran through aqueducts, and it was dirty, and it was lukewarm. In fact, it was known by many who visited You know, you've gone to places in the world, and what do the travel agents say? Don't drink the water. There's a sense in which if you had gone to Laodicea, it might have been said, don't drink the water. Because it made people nauseous. It was so tepid. And Jesus takes that and said, hey, the kind of person who says, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle, they make me nauseous. You're either hot or you're cold. You're in or you're out. What does Paul say, Romans 12, 11? Jesus wants us to be fervent in spirit. If we're going to worship, then let's do it with all our soul and all that is within us, Psalm 103, verse 3. And if we're going to pray, let's do it without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. Let's go over to Capernaum and grab a hold of Jesus because he's out of his mind. Have you ever been taken for a fanatic? And if not, why not? If not, why not? I hope you're known at work as the kind of Jesus freak. Or, you know, people know to try and avoid you a little bit because at some point in the conversation, you're going to remind them, turn or burn, you know, kind of deal. And so there's this sense of, hey, you know, he's one of them. She's one of them. There's this kind of radicalism beyond the norm. It's not room temperature. It's not the averages. I've often enjoyed reading something of the life of D.L. Moody. Founded Moody Church in Chicago, which ultimately then founded the Moody Bible Institute. He was kind of a, a Billy Graham before there was a Billy Graham. Traveled the UK and throughout the US, and God used him in a marvelous way. Google this little phrase because he became known as Crazy Moody. His friends and and workmates and those in the world thought he was crazy because he had a little bit of a real estate business. He was involved in commerce and was doing well for himself, and he gave it all up for pennies in the ministry. And I said, are you crazy, Moody? He was also kind of known as crazy Moody, even among some within the church, because he broke beyond the boundaries of the church and the four walls of us four and no more. And he went out into the slums of Chicago and he found the worst little urchins imaginable. And he put a little Sunday school together for them and he got clothes and he got food and he loved on these boys. In fact, several of them came to know Christ. They were called the Moody Gang. And they would go back into the slums and bring their friends. And before you know it, there's eight, 900 kids coming to Moody and will be the nucleus of the Moody Church and that ministry. And even those in the church said, Moody, are you crazy? And then I think just the fact that in a day when you weren't meant to speak about someone's personal faith in polite conversation, Moody would just go bursting and busting into all those kinds of conversations with, do you know Jesus Christ as your own and personal Savior? If you died today, do you have a hope of going to heaven? In fact, if my memory serves me, I remember reading the story of Moody where a lady speaking to her husband about an encounter with Moody said, you know what, this man, he kind of buttonholed me today and challenged me about my need to get born again and put my faith in Jesus Christ. And her husband was a little irate and said, did you not tell him to mind his own business? To which she is supposed to have replied, but if you had heard him, you would have thought it was his business. 
And out of sheer character and commitment and force of personality, Moody was known for that. Crazy Moody. That's not a bad nickname, is it? I wouldn't mind that. Crazy de Corsi. You know? A fool for Christ. So that's the kind of unfortunate misjudgment. The scene changes in verse 22. We move from the skepticism of Jesus' family, probably his unbelieving brothers, John 7, verse 5, to the downright, outright rejection of the Jewish leaders of the Lord Jesus Christ. This wasn't the first time they had confronted him and had started a controversy with him, and it wouldn't be the last time. As we said, the first phase of his Galilean ministry is finishing. The second phase is beginning. But let's pick up where we left off in the first phase. Go to chapters 3 and verse 6. This is one of the controversies when Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. We read in verse 6 of Mark 3, Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians. That's their cultural enemies, okay? Plotted with the Herodians how they might destroy him. That's where we're at in the story. They had questioned his saying that he could forgive sins. They thought that was blasphemous. They had questioned the fact that if he is the Messiah, what's he doing sitting down and eating with tax collectors and sinners? He's healing on the Sabbath. And so the controversy is bubbling over, and it's coming to a point now where they are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Because you see, the work that Jesus is doing As far as we're concerned, as far as Mark's concerned, as far as the biblical record's concerned, this is a work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, when you go to Mark chapter 1 and verse 10, we see at the beginning of his ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ was indeed filled by the Spirit. The Spirit descends like a dove upon him. So every act of Jesus Christ is being underwritten by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. But we're coming to a real low point in the growing controversy and conflict between these religious leaders and the Lord Jesus Christ because they're going as far as to say that that which is the work of the Holy Spirit is really the work of Satan. Just want you to be clear about that. This will bring us to the heart of this sin, the unpardonable sin. They have formed a deliberate opinion They are unrepentant in their resolve as they oppose the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going as far as to say, he's not the son of man. He's the servant of Satan. This is the unforgivable malice. So, verse 23 through to the end of the chapter. Three things, the charge, the counter, the caution. The charge is, as I've said, that Jesus is casting out demons in the name of the prince of demons, okay? Look at verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem, this is probably an official delegation, not unlike chapter 7 and verse 1. So they come to Capernaum, they come to Galilee, and here's what they say of the exorcisms of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Mark doesn't tell us this, but Matthew tells us in chapter 12 that the Lord Jesus had cast out a demon of a deaf and dumb man. So it was an exorcism had it taken place. Mark doesn't tell us that. Matthew does. So this then triggers their response. He has Beelzebub. And by the ruler of the demons, he has cast out the demons. This is their charge. And make no mistake about it. It's a serious one. They're charging Christ with being in league with the kingdom of darkness. And they are entrenched in this position. I say that because... The verb they said in verse 22 and they said in verse 30 is in the imperfect tense in the Greek grammar, which means they were continually saying. They were resolute and entrenched in this. There was no talking them out of it. They had now come to the settled conviction that Jesus Christ is a fake. Worse than that, he's a demon-possessed apostate. Serious business, isn't it? He's a demon-possessed apostate who must be quickly silenced. We've read in chapter 3, verse 6, they're already working out ways to destroy him. They were attributing the work of the Spirit to the work of Satan. That's fundamentally at the heart of the sin that's unpardonable. 
They were calling good evil and evil good, and woe betide the person that does that, Isaiah 5.20. That's the charge. What's the counter? Jesus doesn't take this line down, and so he counterpunches. It's a one-two with parables. And in the first parable, which is kind of, hey, common sense tells you that a kingdom that's divided against itself, a kingdom that's in civil war will destroy itself will become prey to its enemies. Or take a house. When mom and dad aren't working together, or when the children are disobeying the parents, or whatever the case, sibling rivalry, a house divided against itself can't stand either. You know? Not a great analogy, but take a football analogy. You know, you can't have the defense fighting the offense on the same team. They're on the same team. A team that's divided, a team that's playing against each other, well, they're going to defeat each other. And that's Jesus' point here. If I may put it like this, he's saying Satan may be evil, but he's not dumb. Are you telling me that I just cast out a demon who's in league and alliance with Satan, and you're telling me as a servant of Satan I did that? That's an own goal. That's to shoot oneself in the foot. Why would Satan have one part of his kingdom working against another part of his kingdom? It's illogical. Satan may be evil, but he's not dumb. I'm no Beelzebub working for him, and I'm certainly not working for the prince of demons. The counter. There's a second part to it. Having kind of shown how logical their argument is, Jesus then goes on to explain really what happened. And he tells another parable about, you know, if somebody's going to break into a house, look at verse 27. He's going to break into a house, but the man's in the house. The strong man's in the house. He's not going to go to get away with the silver. And he's not going to get away with the 60-inch flat screen until he has tied up the strong man in the house. Then he can plunder his stuff. Then he can nab the goodies. And Jesus is saying, your argument's flawed. It's illogical. It doesn't make sense. Satan doesn't fight against Satan. I'll tell you what's going on. I'm not under Satan. I'm over Satan. And I'll prove to you how I'm over Satan because I just plundered his house. I just cast out a demon. I just released a captive. And that proves that I bound the strong man. Satan couldn't stop me because I have authority over him. And Jesus has been proving that, right? And his authority over disease and his authority over demons. So that's his argument. That's his counter. Their charge is, hey, you're a servant of Satan. Beelzebub is a word that the commentators debate over. It can mean Lord of the flies or Lord of the dunghill, another title for Satan. But many argue it can also mean Lord of the dwelling place. And given this reference to a dwelling place, a house that Jesus plunders, I think that's probably more the meaning, that Beelzebub means Lord of the dwelling place of demons, the domain of darkness. So they've charged Jesus as one who has come from the domain of darkness at the behest of Satan. And Jesus counters that and said, that's crazy. That means Satan's fighting against himself. No, it's the opposite, guys. I'm not under him. I'm over him. And I've proven that. I tied the strong man and I plundered his house. I released the captive. Brings us to the last thought, the caution. Having refuted the charge, Jesus now issues the warning in verse 28 through 30. And he cautions these religious leaders that their toes are up against the edge of a precipice. So dangerous and so deadly. Listen to what Jesus says, assuredly. This will be used some 18 times, I believe, in Mark's gospel. It means truly, you better listen up. I'm about to say something serious. Put your ears on and give me your full attention. And I'm about to tell you something that is true. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But there's an exception to that. But He who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never, that's scary, never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. 
It seems that they were only a step or two away from committing that sin in calling Jesus unclean. They were blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, we want to look at this quickly. I want to be serious for a few moments and sensitive. Serious because of the subject matter. There could be something more serious than this. That there's something can be done on earth that will never be undone for all of eternity. There is no forgiveness, no redemption. A lost cause. Again, we're setting that against the background. We're a church that loves the glory and the breadth and depth of God's forgiveness. And in fact, it's even mentioned here, the breadth and depth of God's forgiveness, that all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, whatever the blasphemies. But there is a sin so blasphemous, so gross, so dark, so vile, that there's no way back. And this requires sensitivity because I have met people who think they've committed this sin. And you probably have. One stage or maybe now wrestles with the thought, maybe I've committed this sin. And I'll tell you what, that requires a lot of sensitivity because someone that goes there will torment themselves with the thought that they're done and damned. Now, let me say this just by way of a footnote pastorally. 99.9% of the people that I've talked to, I have no doubt they haven't committed the sin because they're in my office or I'm talking to them over a coffee and there's turmoil and there's conscience and there's guilt and there's concern and there's a desire to be right with God. That's not someone that's committed the unpardonable sin. In fact, the person that's committed it won't even know they've committed it. They'll be so dead, so antagonistic, so on the other side of the gospel. That's what we have here. These are men that are coming to a point where they want to destroy Jesus. They are angry. Their will against God becomes resolute. And their conscience becomes dead. If you've had questions about the unpardonable sin, chances are Philip DeCourcy answered them in today's message here on Know the Truth. If not, be sure to tune in tomorrow as we conclude this message, The Unpardonable Sin. You know, it's easy to take Christian radio for granted. Most of us probably tune in each day without giving a second thought to what would happen if this Bible teaching wasn't available. But the fact is, without the generous support of listeners like you, we wouldn't be on the air at all. And right now, we'd like to extend a big thanks to everyone who's given to support Know the Truth on this station. Your gifts are changing lives through the bold teaching of God's Word. And you can join what God is doing by giving a donation right now. Simply call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. And if you prefer to send a check, address your envelope to Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. When you give, we'll send you our thanks along with a brand new book titled Global Reset. In this book, readers will discover the great reset agenda that sets the stage for the end time scenario as prophesied in scripture. Learn how China, America, and other great nations are beginning to play a dominant role in international, socioeconomic, and political dynamics and what believers can do to stem the tide of decline and prepare for God's great reset, the millennial reign of Christ. A copy is yours when you give to know the truth. Again, call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. And while you're there, check out the free devotional we're offering to our new listeners. It's titled, Resting in God's Daily Sufficiency, and we think you and your loved ones will enjoy it. Sign up and invite others to receive it at ktt.org. I'm Wayne Shepherd. Happy Fourth of July to everyone, and I invite you to come back tomorrow as we learn what it really means to be dead to our sins but alive in Christ. That's Tuesday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm-hmm.